to talk about Hamilton's vision, judicial review and national authority. And we're going to have these great panels in the morning where uh, these judges are interviewed about what Hamilton's vision of the Constitution was. We have uh, forthcoming debates on the future of conservatism with uh, uh, leading thinkers. We're going to Dallas to discuss does the First Amendment protect hate speech, and then it's this phenomenal December culminating in Bill of Rights Day. Uh, OK. Um, Frank Four is national correspondent for The Atlantic. He's a fellow at the New America Foundation. He edited The New Republic for seven glorious years, during which it was a beacon of reason and enlightenment in an anxious culture. He is uh, the author of How Soccer Explains the World, which has uh, won the National Jewish Book Award, and his uh, new book, World Without Mind, The Existential Threat of Big Tech, has taken the country by storm. It's come at a moment when uh, the nation is rethinking the role of the platforms in our lives. Some of the praise that it's earned include NPR, which says World Without Mind is a searing take, a polemic packed with urgency and desperation. And uh, Steve Cole, the Pulitzer Prize winner, who says calls it a vital response to digital utopianism at a time when we desperately need new ethics for social media. Please join me in welcoming Frank Four. So much to talk about, Frank, but this is a polemic about the dangerous influence of the platforms, uh, Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon, the Europeans, Europeans call them GAFA, on our culture and our lives. What is the danger of the platforms? Well, so these companies have insinuated themselves really deeply within our lives, and I think everybody who has Everybody has a phone <laughs> understands that. Um, they've, they've, they've amassed this giant concentration of power where they're able to exert control over markets, over the public sphere, and therefore over our democracy, but also over our future as a species. So when I, was, when I started to research this book, I sat down and I watched YouTube of Larry Page, the CEO of Google, Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook. And I listen to them. And they say, they, they, when they, they appear in public at town hall meetings or addressing conferences of developers, they get lots of attention when they unveil whatever the latest phone is and uh, you know, whether it ha the, the phone has a camera that has a better resolution. And that becomes the thing that the tech press reports on. But really, if you listen hard to the people who run these companies, they have very interesting things to say about human nature, about the human species. And they have actually a vision about where they want to lead us. And um, you listen to Larry Page talk about human beings. He describes, he describes us as essentially machines. We're collections of code. We're piles of algorithms. And therefore, it makes a whole lot of sense for us to become cyborg. That's really just the natural course of human evolution for the human machine to merge with the other machines. Or if you listen to Mark Zuckerberg talk, he says that uh, he, he has a, a whole idea about sharing that's about a very different idea about us as our, our, ourselves. So he says that in order to have integrity as a human being, you have to be the same person you are in your office as you are in private, and that if you're not, you're a hypocrite. And so he's using his platform in order to lead us to this new place. And so human beings have always had technology. Technology is one of the things that actually defines us as a species. We can affect our environment. Um, we've, we, and, and, and tools are extensions of the human being. But these, these tools are different. It's not just a hammer that's extending the arm. It's not just a factory that's automating upper body s strength. These are intellectual machines. They, they automate intellectual processes. And these, these platforms, these devices, stand between us and reality. They're the way that we see the world, the ways in which we understand reality. And soon, we're going to be inhabiting their virtual realities. And so we're in the process right now of merging with these, these machines uh, in, in very, very physical sorts of ways. People wear Apple watches on their wrist. 
um, we've all become a little bit cyborg in how we outsource our sense of direction to, to Google Maps. I, I couldn't have gotten here tonight if it wasn't for, for Google Maps. Um, we're going to be wearing augmented reality at some point um, on the bridge of our noses. And Sergey Brin talks about the moment when Google is going to be implanted inside of your brain. And so the point that I wanted to make in this book, really the reason that I'm so disturbed about what's happening, is that we're not just merging with tools. We're merging with machines, and we're merging with the, we're merging with the companies that operate those machines. And so their values end up becoming our values. Um, indeed. <laughs> Aside from that, we're in really good shape, um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. There's so much to say both about your philosophical critique, about your, uh, the dystopian vision of the uh, platform-based future that you uh, face and your solutions. But I want to break it, break it down and go through the Yeah, but can, can I just, say, can I just say one thing? So I, you know, when, I, when I deliver that critique of the companies, I, I want to be clear that I think that the Google, Google search engine is one of the most spectacular creations of humankind. It's a real achievement of engineering that you're able to create a machine where you're able to type in whatever question you have and get back a response instantaneously, that the iPhone is a masterpiece of design and engineering. And we, we don't want to throw these things into the sea. We're not saying that we need to go back to becoming hunter-gatherers in order to, uh, to live better lives. The point is, is that we should be able to take these technologies and harness them for human purposes, that we should have a sense of what it is that we want to preserve about us as a species as we move forward, and that we should be deliberate and we should create rules. So when automobiles were invented, um, they, they mowed down, they, they were both efficient. It was, an incre it was compared to horses and buggies or trains. It was the, the ability to get from point A to point B and, and to be able to guide your destination. And it, it's a pretty incredible invention, but people got killed by cars because there were no rules initially. There were no stop signs. There were no um, speed limits. And so we decided that we would take this fantastic new technology and we would bend it to the purposes of human beings. And so we created fuel efficiency standards and a whole standardized system for using it. And right now, when it comes to these technologies and these platforms, they're essentially operating in a way in which we've, we've, we've basically said, all right, whatever you do, we trust you. Whatever outcome you're trying to achieve, we'll just let you go in the direction that you want to go, and we're not going to ask very hard questions of you. It's a central point. You're neither a Luddite nor a techno enthusiast. You're insisting, like Larry Lessig, who you note in the book, that code is law, that it's the uh, algorithms and rules that harness these platforms that will determine our values, and we have to insist that Amer that constitutional values and human values are embedded into the algorithms. So let's talk about some concrete examples, and Facebook is where I want to start, and we sure. were just discussing this op-ed in the New York Times this morning about the editor of a newspaper in Serbia who got uh, most of his readership from Facebook, and when Facebook changed its algorithm recently to privilege personal stuff that people shared and to downgrade news sources, he lost his ability to criticize the government. What does that say about Facebook's power over journalism and what can journalism do about it? So I could tell the story in a way that relates to both you and I, which is that um, when I was editor of the New Republic, the magazine was bought, well actually, before I became editor of the New Republic, the magazine was bought by Mark Zuckerberg's roommate, Chris Hughes. He was a co-founder of Facebook. And he entered the New Republic as kind of a mythical savior. He came in and he said, I share your commitment to serious journalism. Um, I have deep pockets. And I can help lead you to a dignified solution where you're able to thrive in a digital age because I invented social media. And it started out as an incredible sort of thing. But then he got to this moment where he said, you know what? I need to make some money off of this. And so the only way to make money is to grow traffic. And the only way to grow traffic now is through Facebook, by creating things that will be successful on Facebook. And so at the New Republic, we live this very 
compressed microcosm of recent media history where we had to rush to embrace the platform. Now, all of journalism, whether it likes it or not, and I don't think journalism especially likes it, is highly dependent on Facebook. And if you go into the Washington Post or CNN or any newsroom, you'll see hovering above the newsroom giant screens projecting the, the traffic of a website at any given moment. And also suggest it's projecting how articles are doing on Facebook at any given moment. And those screens are there in order to, sit, to, to suggest what journalists should be doing over the course of their day. They need to be producing things that are successful there. Um, and so what Facebook does, Facebook, Facebook is a giant feedback loop. Facebook takes data, and data is this x-ray of your soul. It's this incredibly intimate portrait of the inside of your head. Data is everywhere you've traveled on the internet, everything you've read, every, every query you've entered into Google, every purchase that you've made. And, it's, and, 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 and when you, if you're able to read that data in the correct sort of way, you're able to understand the things that give your audience pleasure and the things that make them anxious. And what Facebook does is it takes that information and it arrays information in order to keep you engaged on its site for as long as possible. They're trying to addict you. And they're doing it through these kind of very, very clever behavioral means. And when it comes to politics, you can see this incredibly clearly. Because what happens is, is that all right, we've all been sorted into, into tribes, political tribes, for a whole variety of reasons. But what Facebook does is it reinforces those filter bubbles that we reside within because it confirms our biases. Um, that Facebook is, is giving you the information that you want in order to keep you engaged for as long as possible. And it's not just bad actors who are exploiting that. We saw that in the last election. But it's good actors who are doing that as well. In order to be successful at the New Republic, we ended up having to do what Facebook asked of us, essentially, in order to get that traffic. And so the New Republic was a magazine that kind of prided itself on its contrarianism, probably to a fault at some moments. But um, we shifted. And so if, when I was editor of the New Republic and Jeff came to me with an idea, and if I, if I wanted to dismiss that idea, I would say, well, the idea that you just supplied me is conventional wisdom. That was kind of the harshest thing that you could say at the New Republic oh, about anything. Yeah, <laughs> conventional it still, wisdom. It still hurts. It I still know. stings, I know. <laughs> and so we went from that to being something that was kind of chasing um, popularity on Facebook. because. To be popular, you, what, you're, what, what journalism on Facebook is all about is latching on to the thing that's kind of ascending to, to popularity. Trending is the most essential term when it comes to social media. And I'll give you, I'll give you an example of the way that this worked, which is that uh, a couple years ago, there was, um, there was a lion um, called Cecil. Um, yeah. Everybody knows because Cecil was like the Kim Kardashian of lions, and um, and I don't mean to, and, and he was it, so Cecil was killed. Cecil was killed by a hunter from Minnesota, and um, which I think we can all concede in this room, it's, it's a terrible thing to to shoot endangered species, and this hunter was gloating over uh, his assassination of Cecil, and the internet became outraged over it. And so every news organization in the world could see this outrage percolating. And they wanted to jump on it and exploit it and scrape traffic from it. And so every news organization from the um, Huffington Post to BuzzFeed to the highbrow magazines like uh, The Atlantic and The New Yorker all decided to converge on this one topic because it was successful on Facebook. And at the end of the day, there were 3.2 million stories written about Cecil the Lion. And I think you could argue that Donald Trump is maybe the equivalent in some ways of Cecil the Lion. And, and that you can see the ways in which media just converges on subjects that if, if Donald Trump talks about Barack Obama's birth certificate, 
maybe media knows better than to give that any attention, but you can see the ways in which um, that exploits people's emotions, that there are people who, who want to hear that because it confirms their biases. There are people who enjoy reading about that because they hate hearing that. And it's that anxiety and that fear and that anger that's being exploited. And that, I think at the New Republic, what I, I found myself subconsciously doing over time was, was you know, the, this imperative to succeed on Facebook actually was intellectually distorting me, where I found that in order, I wanted to win on the internet, and so, because that's what my boss told me to do, and because I'm a human being and I like, and I have these analytics and I, want, I see what's successful and what's not, and I want to I wanna achieve success, I found that I probably took the magazine further to the left, because I, I, it, we were rewarded on Facebook with massive numbers by giving people what they wanted to hear. It's intellectually distorting. And for the rest of us, uh, for the rest of the world, for, for, for voters, for, for citizens, I think it's intellectually incapacitating if you're just hearing the things that you want to hear constantly. It makes you susceptible to fake news, propaganda, demagoguery, the manipulation of, of bad actors. And not only that, that's not bad enough, Dayenu, this is the, a fundamental threat to uh, democracy. You quote Louis Brandeis, our mutual hero, who channeled Thomas Jefferson in saying it's the duty of people thoughtfully to deliberate with those with whom they disagree, to develop their faculties and to have slow deliberation over time that can only emerge by the public deliberation that's a political duty and listening to people of different points of view. That can't happen in a Facebook world of filter bubbles and echo chambers where people only see and hear the news they're predisposed to agree with and where decisions are made so fast because everything is happening at warp speed. Um, you do have some solutions at the end of your book. Solutions to very deep problems are not always obvious, but w what are the most constructive solutions to this media problem you've confronted of the filter bubbles and echo chambers and fast deliberation? How, what would Brandeis do to solve this problem? Well, um, I think, well, Brandeis, Brandeis gives us the conceptual framework for it all because Brandeis defined two of the most important concepts that help us understand the internet. One is the problem of excessive concentrations of private power in the form of monopolies, which is what we're, we're, we're witnessing right now. We're witnessing, um, we're witnessing the rise of potentially the most powerful monopolies in human history. I mean, look at, look at where Amazon's headed right now in terms of its capture of retail. Amazon's on a glide path right now to achieve basically, 50% of all retail in the next couple of years is going to occur through Amazon. That's not just selling books, it's not just selling socks, it's, it's everything. And, it, and you just, just to dwell on this for a second, I mean these companies have kind of are limitless in their ambitions. So Amazon started off as the everything store, right? That's a pretty big, well it started off as a bookstore. Then it became the everything store. That's a pretty big ambition, right? And then it became a movie, movie studio. And then it owned the Washington Post. And then it bought Whole Foods. And then it powers the cloud. <laughs> and so everybody who does any sort of computing is most likely dependent in some way, shape, or form on Amazon's cloud. And so what Brandeis would suggest is that we need to find ways to limit these concentrations of power by um, by, through, through breaking up companies, through uh, preventing their ability to merge with other companies. Um, and then secondly, Brandeis, of course, helped develop our, our understanding of privacy. And um, he understood perfectly the danger that these companies would pose ultimately to privacy, which is the one where if somebody is looking over your shoulder, you, you lose the ability to be an independent thinker. Um, that you're always worried about pleasing your audience. Um, you're always worried that whatever thought that you are turning over in your head could ultimately become broadcast to the world, and so you would become more cautious as a thinker. And it's gobsmacking that in this country, there is no law protecting your data. There, there are laws that protect health 
data, the laws that protect financial data, but there's really no comprehensive data protection law. And, and, and these companies have amassed their power on the basis of their surveillance. Google, Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google, says that he can anticipate where you're going to be 24 hours from now based on all of the data that they've amassed about you. And I think he's probably right. <laughs> So I, we've toiled in the privacy trenches uh, together, uh, but uh, and you propose a kind of data privacy commission along the European model. But are things that much better in Europe? Well, Europe is on the is on the on the brink of ushering in a much more comprehensive data protection regime, um, and Americans are fairly dismissive. So it's, it's easy to scoff at what the Europeans have done over time. And they've made some serious missteps. Like I think that the right to be forgotten is, is something that both you and I would have problems with. Um, but the Europeans started off with this instinct that these companies were dangerous. They were doing it often for um, culturally nationalist reasons. And, they, and Europeans don't necessarily have the same anti-monopoly tradition that we have. It's, a, it's an environment that's kind of celebrated cartels over uh, it's the long sweep of modern European history. But for whatever reason, they've kind of gravitated towards a direction that's actually very consistent with the American way of thinking about concentrations of power, especially in the realm of communications. But just the data privacy point, how, how would a data privacy Commission give us more of the intellectual privacy that Brandeis sought? So I think it's, it's essentially right now when you're presented with, um, it, it needs, it, what, I, what I want is not just an, a, a commission, I want a whole data protection regime. That means that when the terms of service agreements that were offered with, offered up to us that are these, these kind of very extreme all or nothing agreements where you either kind of sign everything away to these companies or you don't use these platforms which are essential to participating in the world. I mean, that's a pretty, de it's a pretty bad deal for users. And I think if you, had, if you had a regime that was able to impose restrictions on what these companies could collect, what they could commoditize, um, and you had um, an authority that looked at what, I, what I'm interested in is having a, a, a data protection authority that looks at these questions fairly comprehensively and not just as a, as a matter of enforcing privacy, but also uh, looking at mergers and competition policy from the perspective of trying to limit surveillance. Just one to press one more bit on this because we both care so much about it. When you define the problem of what you quote Neil Richards as calling intellectual privacy, which was the Brandeisian idea that when you're constantly afraid that someone's looking over your shoulder, you're more inhibited and more constrained. Uh, that's not a problem of the misuse of private data. It's the fact that everyone is performing on Facebook in order to get an audience. So aren't we guilty of just effacing the boundaries ourselves? And can a data protection authority not solve well, that? Well, I think that part of the problem, so the, there are two separate problems. One is what you're saying where, um, uh, people are, are performing publicly and broadcasting every single thought, every single image, every single moment. There's not a whole lot government can do to stop that. But let's say it, you know, your Google searches are, are threatened to become public. Eventually, that will happen, right? And, and so your, your entire reading history is going to become public. All of these ideas, like if, if, you, if, you're, if you're a young kid and you um, are interested in um, socialism or Islamic extremism or, 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 or Jewish fundamental, whatever, that could then become held, up, held against you. And so you're, you're disincentivized from um, exploring ideas in that sort of world where everything that you've done, and, and your, if your purchases become public, that, 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 that that makes us more ca uh, cautious. There was a, um, there was a woman, um, uh, the Guardian ran a piece about a month ago from a woman who uh, wa worked with European lawyers to get her Tinder data. So Tinder is this dating app that apparently all the kids use now. Um, 
thank God, I, I, I got married before the age of the internet. Um, and so she was able to get back all of her data. And it, she got an 800 page file from Tinder. And um, she was ashamed. She couldn't believe that all these things that she thought were ephemeral, all these interactions, all these um, swipes, all these judgments that she made about other human beings were, were, were stored because these companies keep every single shard of information. And we treat these machines as if, um, if, as if they're confidants. And in fact, we confide more in these machines than we would ever confide in any of our friends. A powerful uh, example. Tell us more about the problem of Google. The Europeans have prohibited Google from favoring its own products over those of its competitors and have also imposed antitrust regulations on it. Tell us what the Europeans are doing and what problem they're responding to and whether it's working. So the problem, so, so Google shows, when we search on Google, we're not just, Google, Google is giving us information about news, events, about human beings, but also about what to buy, right? And so what Google ends up picking at the top, placing at the top of their search results ends up becoming the currency of the realm. It becomes the information that we gravitate to most and we, we, we read most carefully. You know, nobody ever makes it to page four of a Google search. Um, uh, when it comes to the, the, the products that end up getting to the top of Google, um, that ends up becoming the thing that we're probably more likely to buy. And so, more generally, this is, a pro this is like the problem of these companies that we're describing, which is that they're picking winners and losers. We don't understand that always or appreciate that, but they're deciding what's important and what's not important in every single realm. So what the Europeans have been pushing for, well, here's another example. So um, a couple years ago, if you wanted to find a restaurant, or a coffee shop or whatever, you would type the name in and the first result that would come up would be a Yelp page. And Yelp would, would, would aggregate reviews and um, Google saw that that was a pretty great business model. And so they ended up doing exactly the same sort of thing. And they kind of hardwired it into the search engine. So it acts as if it's kind of a seamless part of the search. It's not like you're, de you're deciding between Google and Yelp. It's like whatever Google is presenting about a restaurant is the gospel opinion of the restaurant. It's the, it's the comprehensive um, piece of information about that restaurant that you're going to use as a reference. And so what Google did was it abused its power to pick winners and losers to, to pick itself as the winner. And if we look forward at the ways in which these Google is operating, Google is trying to be the company that picks winners and losers in every single realm because it presents new opportunities for them to make money. And so what the Europeans have started to do is to push back against this, to say that, all right, if your search engine is gonna be so all powerful, we need to treat it like a common carrier. And common carrier is a very ancient concept within the law and it goes back to roads. So once upon a time, uh, we, we lived in a world where there were toll roads all over the place. And the toll, the toll keeper uh, could decide who would use the road and who wouldn't use the road. And, um, and that's a pretty arbitrary power to have. And so we said, I mean, well, we basically nationalized the roads. But the idea is that if you're going to be able to go through a toll road, that everybody should have to pay the same price. Nobody should be advantaged. Nobody should be disadvantaged. And I think that that's a, that's a very powerful concept to apply to the platforms more generally. To say, all right, we we you know on some level we accept your 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 power because you've achieved it by producing the best product. Um, but if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna maintain that power, you can't abuse it. And you can't self deal. Has it worked in Europe in making the searches more neutral? And could it work in America? Al Franken recently gave a speech calling for that kind of common carrier obligation to be imposed on Google. He gave you lots of shout outs. How would it work in America? Um, 
So we're still, it's hard to know. I mean, we're in the early days and, and the, this ruling in Europe related to Google Shopping, um, which is um, at the top of the Google page is a special uh, carousel that, that allows you to compare products where Google was, um, was, was advantaging itself. And so who knows how it, I, I don't think that it's, a re, it's, it's revolutionary. That's a small application of the type of solution that we're talking about. But more broadly, I think what we can see is it's, it's actually suggesting, so we think about breaking up companies. Um, we think of the example of AT&T where you took Ma Bell and you smashed it into a million little pieces. But maybe there's a soft way of breaking up these companies where you say, all right, so this is another thing that Europeans have been experimenting with, which is when it comes to ad the Google advertising where um, kind of forcing them to u allow third parties to compete in the sale of ads. Um, and it's just, it's an interesting sort of way of thinking about breaking up a company where you're, you're not saying we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna apply the mallet to you. You're saying, you know what? There's certain spaces that you control where we're going to force you to be more competitive, to allow, to allow third parties to come in and to have access to the same, same placements, the same resources, and to, to create a bit of competition there. Is Franken proposing a bill along those lines, and might it possibly pass? So uh, not only because he gave my book an incredible plug, uh, do I think Al Franken is a, a visionary politician? No, but I think that, that you have, what's happening right now is so fascinating in terms of the politics. So you have, you have uh, w w let's go from left to right. So you have, uh, you have Elizabeth Warren who has given, gave a very important speech a year ago about the problem of monopoly in America in which she complained about Google, Facebook, and Amazon. And so she, she was really ahead of the pack in calling attention to this. And then after the Donald Trump election, Democrats said, you know what? There's all this populist anger in the country. How do we, how do we produce a responsible policy agenda to, resp to respond to that populist anger. And so the Democrats actually started talking about monopoly, the problem of monopoly for the first time in you know, 40 years, 50 years. Um, and so th that became a central plank in whatever the, the policy agenda that Chuck Schumer developed. Chuck Schumer did not go after the platform companies, but Al Franken did. He gave this speech that you described last week. So you have that percolating on the left. Then let's shift to the center. Um, I mean, the, one of the things that sh should be said is that these companies, um, these companies have become not just the target of kind of 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 of, of lefties, but they're actually um, people in the middle who care about this as well. Bill Galston and Bill Crystal have an organization called No Labels, and they've made attacking the titans of tech. Uh, one of the, the five big ideas that they're pursuing this year. Um, and let's shift over to the right. You have, you have Steve Bannon railing against Silicon Valley. You have Donald Trump complaining about the Amazon Washington Post. Now, I don't necessarily think that they're, do, they're railing against these, reason, these companies for reasons that I myself would share. But I think that there's something interesting happening right now where um, Across the political spectrum, there's an awareness that we're dealing with a new phenomenon and that we need to, and, and that new phenomenon is running amok and that it needs to be reined in. In the election of 1912, which we both know and love, all three major candidates, Taft, Wilson, and Roosevelt, were opposed to monopoly. They had different proposals. Roosevelt wanted to regulate the banks. Uh, Wilson wanted to break them up, and Taft wanted vigorous antitrust prosecution. But there was a bipartisan consensus against monopoly. Could the consensus that you're describing actually lead to legislative action the way it did in 1912 or not? I think it can. I mean, right now we're in the early days of a backlash where you have anger at the companies. You have a sense of misgiving. Um, but in terms of solutions, the thinking is very, very underdeveloped because 
we haven't thought about the problem of monopoly for a long time. And uh, when we, had, we have thought about the problem of monopoly, we've thought about it in ways that are not at all applicable to these companies. So antitrust right now is defined still by a paper that Robert Bork wrote in the mid-60s where he said, we should only care about monopolies when they threaten consumer welfare. And so by which he meant we should only care about monopolies when they leverage their power over markets to jack up prices. Now, Google and Facebook are free. Amazon's prices are damn low. And so they don't really, the, 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 the existing models of regulation and thinking about monopoly simply don't apply. And so we're gonna need to have an intellectual kind of revolution to kind of catch up with the problem. You sketch out some possibilities using Amazon as an example. You say, obviously, the problem isn't jacking up prices. It's the opposite. By lowering prices beyond the cost of production, Amazon is driving out small producers and right. bookstores. As an alternative, you suggest competition, and you invoke Brandeis, and you note that Brandeis insisted that the point of the uh, antitrust laws was not uh, efficiency but liberty. Yes. Tell us more about what a neo-Brandeisian approach to uh, antitrust in the age of the platforms would look like. Right. So what Brandeis was concerned about was that um, everybody would go to work for a set of big corporations and that those big corporations would be able to kind of dictate political terms to its employees. I mean, that was among, among his fears. Um, but he also, and it, the, he had a vision for the republic that was based on uh, kind of almost a fetishization for the small shopkeeper and the independent producer. And we, the world has evolved a long ways away from the economy that Brandeis lived in. But I think that some of his concerns really do resonate in the present, which is what you're describing. Economists have a term called monopsony, which is what happens when you have a big seller that's able to dictate terms to everybody who makes things. And so you saw it with Walmart a lot. So if I, if, if I was making pickles, um, Walmart I would sell my pickles to this massive, it, Walmart became my essential vendor. And as I came to depend on Walmart to sell my pickles, Walmart would keep tightening the screw. They'd say, all right, you know, now you need to make them in these massive jars and you have to sell them for $1.99. And I would have no choice but to do what Walmart tells me to do. And um, I mean, there is a way in which that ends up kind of crushing the, the liberty of the people who produce pickles. And, and damn it, we should care about pickle producers. Um, but you see it in, in, I mean, to me, I was awakened to the dangers of Amazon because of its monopoly in books. And so um, a couple years ago, Amazon was engaged in uh, one of its periodic contract renegotiations with the publishers over the terms of its ebook sales. Now, Amazon has a genuine monopoly in ebook sales, where it's, it's somewhere between 70 and 90% of ebook sales happen through Amazon to be read on Kindles. And so Amazon just has incredible ability to set the terms for how they're priced, what, what it, because it's the, it's, it's the display window if you want your stuff elevated and put in front of as many readers as possible, you have to pay Amazon money to get the good placement. And we really don't know the terms of that. that. So Amazon was negotiating this with Hachette, which is a massive French publishing conglomerate who publishes Little Brown, 12, uh, you know, these, these publishing houses. It's like they have lots of different names on the spines of the book, but it's just it's like four or five big publishers. And Hachette said, you know, enough. We can't, we can't give you any more. Stop, stop right now. And, and Amazon said, well, you want to mess with us? Here's what it happens when you mess with us. And they stripped the buy button from Hachette books. In some instances, if you typed in one Hachette book, um, it would, you'd be redirected to a book from, say, Simon & Schuster. And so Amazon played extremely dirty in that game. And, um, and if you're a book producer, that does, that does have the effect of, 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 of cramping your, your liberty. And it's hard to be sympathetic to an oligopoly, to one of these big publishing houses. They're not, 
They're not model companies, but um, they've been brought to their knees in a lot of respects by, by Amazon. So do we need a new conception of antitrust or an application of this old idea of competition to this new economy? Right. So let me just say a couple things more about the book publishers. Number one, they actually, so what Hachette did in terms of fighting back actually did have the effect of ultimately staving off Amazon to an extent, which is that unlike newspapers and unlike the rest of the media, which kind of basically exceeded to the demands of Google and Facebook who wanted all their stuff to be free on the internet, book publishers defended the fundamental economic value of their product. You can't get books for free, even though Google was trying to make that happen ultimately by destroying intellectual property by scanning every book and putting it on online for in its entirety for free, which is what they did initially. Um, so I think it's, that's, that's one important point, is that we need to blame media t to a certain extent for its own affliction because it didn't, it didn't defend the underlying economic value of the thing that it produced. So, sorry to interrupt, but wasn't one of the responses of the booksellers itself, ironically, challenged by the Justice Department as a violation of antitrust law? Exactly. They, they got together with Apple, and they said, you know what? We need to, we, we need to be, well, first of all, they did something that Brandeis would have, would have appreciated, which was Brandeis was a defender of price fixing and the idea that if I produce something, I should be able to say what it costs in the marketplace. And Amazon, when it introduced eBooks, arbitrarily and without telling the book publisher, said that all eBooks would cost $9.99. And so that, that had the effect of deflating, they were attempting to deflate the entire process, the entire market for eBooks in order to make it an Amazon type market. Amazon markets are always high volume, low price. And so the book publishers got together with Apple and they said, and, and, and they did this very indiscreetly over lunch, they colluded. They said, you know what, we need to all get together to resist Amazon and so we're gonna set the price of eBooks at $12.99 and we're gonna work with you, Apple, to become our primary seller in order to counteract Amazon's power. And the Justice Department had nothing to say about Amazon's monopsony, monopoly power, but they, they, they went after, the Obama White House went after Apple and the book publishers. So what would a proper understanding of antitrust law say that would have reached the opposite result? So I think we just need to step way back and we need to recover first principles about antitrust law. So antitrust right now has very, very little to say about the inherent problem of bigness in an economy. So a Amazon can keep amassing, keep merging, keep buying companies, can buy Whole Foods, it can buy, can buy diapers.com, it can buy what, whatever. Um, and there's really no questions asked. So, because antitrust has nothing to say about the problem of bigness. And yet, I think we have to say that there's a massive problem with a company that is going to control 50% of all retail. That's just too much economic power concentrated in one corporation. That they're able to set, the, they're able to control markets everywhere. And they're crowding out competition in markets. So we might like their low prices, we may like their next day delivery, um, but ultimately there's gonna become a moment where Amazon is able to, to set prices on whatever terms they want. Um, and, and they discriminate on the, there's just this other concept, it's kind of esoteric and antitrust about price discrimination, about the problem of when you have uh, a, a, a company that sets two different prices for two different audiences. And a lot of this happens uh, invisibly, but I, you can see this at Whole Foods right now with turkeys for Thanksgiving, where if you're a member of Amazon Prime, you get a damn good deal on your turkey. But if you're not a member of Amazon Prime, you're paying, you know, you're paying five bucks more for that turkey. And so they're basically coercing, you know, they're trying to steer everybody into this Amazon Prime sort of program. They're, 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 and um, you know, these issues that legally don't necessarily have 
bright lines. Um, but I think we need to get to a place where we, we reassert some of those bright lines. So one more beat on this important question. The last great antitrust law, the Sherman Act of 1890, was really vague. It forbade unreasonable restraints in trade. And the Supreme Court, uh, some feel, eviscerated that by allowing any restraints that didn't violate the rule of reason, basically gave judges huge discretion. Do we need a new, more granular statute, or could judicial interpretation address this problem? I think we need a new, more granular statute. The Clayton antitrust law disagrees with your uh, praise of the Sherman as the last great. But um, uh, ab absolutely right. Yeah. Um, and a shout out here. Uh, can we do this? Yeah. Uh, um, Frank's dad, uh, Albert Four, founded the American Antitrust Institute, which was one of the first. Uh, revisionist groups questioning the post borkian consensus about antitrust and insisting on attention to the power of bigness. Um, although my dad probably would think I'm, I, you know, it, it, the, disagree with all the ways in which I wildly riff with like no connection to actual statutes, but I think he would agree that um, that we've gotten so far away from. Um, the original intentions of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is one of, it's an incredible piece of legislation. It's really broad, it's really muscular, and it actually has a problem with monopoly per se. So it actually, the Sherman Antitrust Act would, um, would not like Amazon. But, it, but over time, it's been, as you say, it's been reinterpreted by courts, reinterpreted uh, by regulatory agencies, reinterpreted by Congress in such ways in which it doesn't really have the teeth that we need. And so the only way to really rebound from all that accretion of, of, um, of, of dust that's amounted on those laws and, and that's kind of hardened, hardened the Sherman antitrust into this kind of Im, this immobile creature that we, we can't really use anymore. We, we need something pretty profoundly different. Great. I, of course, have so many more questions, but there's some great ones from the audience, so let's start at them. What if the monopolies allowed people to pay a premium price to keep their data confidential? I mean, I think that there's uh, <laughs> it's kind of a terror. It's, I, I, it's something very profoundly uncomfortable and undemocratic about that, <laughs> to say the least, where you, you'd have um, rich people who would be able to kind of live behind closed doors within gated data communities to do whatever they want. And then you'd have the rest of the world publicly exposed. And let's, you know, the, the, let's talk about some of the risks associated with the diminishment of privacy. One risk is that you get discriminated against on the basis of health, that if, um, and if, if you can be surveilled completely, um, that your eating, drinking habits, your sleep habits, your exercise habits become known to your employers, which pick up the tab for your health insurance, well then, if they know, if they know your predilection towards cancer or illness or what have you in advance, they will, they'll simply not hire you because they don't want to pick up the tab of covering your health care. And so, um, or but the, so there's just all sorts of ways in which you can see that data can be used to discriminate against people, and it would be pretty terrible if rich people were the only people who were insulated from that discrimination. Shouldn't Facebook have known they were being used by the Russians during the last presidential campaign? Also, should Facebook have paid its people in the Trump campaign office to assist with social media? The Clinton campaign turned down Facebook's offer. So. Um, uh, I think Facebook knew exactly what was happening on their platform. I've talked to, and, and Facebook's dissembling about Russian ads is really, I think, um, kind of gallingly proves the point of my argument. That Facebook started off acting as if nothing had happened on their platform at all, that the platform was being used properly by people, and then over time it's kind of unfurled this alternative, truthful history of the presidential campaign where these ads were first seen by a few people, then seen by 150 million people, 
And it's kind of, it, it, how can you trust Facebook if they can't give this honest accounting of how their platform was exploited by a foreign power for very, very nefarious means? And I, I know from people who are, who, are in, who, who know Mark Zuckerberg, who have been associated with the company for a long time, that they could see how the, the platform was being exploited by the Russians, and Sandberg and Zuckerberg just didn't want to do anything about it because the system was acting in the way that it was supposed to act. It's a commodified system. If, if, if anti-Semites want to buy the term Jew hater, um, they were, that, was, that was perfectly OK with Facebook. And certainly Facebook knew that their, their ads were being bought and targeted by racists and anti-Semites. You know, it, takes, it, it would take, it take any sentient human being 30 seconds to consider that possibility if they, if they thought about the way that Facebook's ad system worked. How does Google decide who's at the top of the search results? Damned if I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is the part of the problem, which is that Algorithms are essentially um, non-transparent. That they're they're, uh, they're and, and the companies don't necessarily even understand entirely the ways that their algorithms work, because their algorithms are um, are also sensitive feedback loops that are constantly learning. So Google Google is amassing huge amounts of data. It's sorting that data with algorithms, and its algorithms become smarter on the basis of everything that it's learned in the past, which is why you can see that over time, remember when you first, you know, we first started typing words into Google, Google didn't even really try to guess what those words are. And then over time, it started to guess, and at first those guesses were kind of okay, but over time, those guesses have gotten to be pretty awesome, and they can anticipate what you're going to say incredibly well based on all of your personal information and all of the searches that you've done in the past, but also based on the collective amassing of data that they've done where they can see the way that people have behaved in aggregate over time. Uh, relatedly, what about bots? Don't they influence trending? Um, you know, I, I, I think so, but I'm not sure. I mean, I, it seem, it, I think, this is a question about how sensitive, um, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what they mean by bots influencing trending. They mean like uh, foreign bots that are bought by, by Russians and utilized for those purposes. And can Facebook and Google identify bots and separate them from human beings? And I, I think that they can, but I'm not, not entirely sure. One of our wonderful uh, colleagues has asked a question I asked him, which you uh, didn't quite uh, answer, so I'm glad to ask it again. How do, we get, how do we get Facebook to help us break out of our political bubbles? So I'm, I'm not sure I agree with the premise of the question, which is, um, is it really, is it, so I, I, let, me, let me put it this way. I have complicated feelings about the premise of the question. On the one hand, I want Facebook to behave more responsibly. Um, because, look, they are gatekeepers. They deny that they're a media company. They deny that they're gatekeepers. In fact, uh, a lot of these tech companies have railed against gatekeepers. Um, and they claim that everything is about empowering the individual. And so um, that's just a lie. They, they're, the most they're, they're incredibly powerful gatekeepers. All information requires gatekeeping or it becomes useless. And so in newspapers we, we, or radio stations or TV, it was pretty clear who the gatekeepers were. They were the editor and the, the, the station manager or who, producer, and they would decide what, what would get put above the fold, what would get put on page 18, which subjects wouldn't get coverage at all. And that's a pretty powerful, awesome responsibility to have in a democracy. Um, these guys deny that they're making any of these decisions, and yet, invisibly through algorithms, they're making exactly those sorts of decisions. And so, I, on the one hand, I, I want to say yes, be more responsible in how you make those decisions. But on the other hand, I say these companies, so many, so many, 
so much rides on these companies. Uh, in newspapers, all right, so if a newspaper editor makes one decision, well, you could, go, you could turn to some other medium to get information. Maybe there was another newspaper in town, maybe there's a magazine. There, there, was, there were lots of ways to get information. But so much c goes through Facebook and Google now. And, there's, and, 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 and all of media is dependent on Facebook and Google for their financial health. And so whatever decision Facebook and Google makes about what's real news or fake news or acceptable political discourse or unacceptable political discourse has ramifications for the entire public sphere. And that's so much power to invest in one company or you know, the handful of engineers who run that one company. And that's why you were saying before we came on that perhaps it would be better for Facebook to get out of the business of running news entirely and just run the private stuff. It would disrupt the whole journalism business right. model, but would well, take so that was, out that of the was, business. That was the complaint of the CERB journalist that we, yeah. uh, you talked about, where he said that say, Facebook was running an experiment in a handful of countries where <clears throat> it was making its news feed just pictures from friends and family, information about friends and family, all personal stuff. And then it created a separate feed called an Explorer feed that was all of its kind of news and information feed. And so it was essentially saying, you know what? We don't like being in this p business of gatekeeping. And so we're going to try to degrade it, downgrade it, um, and, and, and push it to the side. And um, for the Serb journalist, it was terrible because his business depended on that Facebook traffic. But I think for the democracy, it could be a good thing that people just shouldn't be getting their news and information from Facebook. I mean, they should be, they should be seeing, about their, um, you know, see, seeing about their cousin's life in California or um, posting pictures of their grandkids or, or doing, doing things like that through it. And that's a perfectly great thing to do. You can use it to stay in touch with people. Um, but, but they shouldn't be learning about, about, about um, uh, climate change or what's happening in the basement of Washington pizza parlors through Facebook. Uh, broadening out, it used to be that young American kids played outside and experienced the world. Now young Americans spend th their time on cell phones and laptops. What's the effect of tech on the character of the nation? Is there any correlation with declining labor force participation and the opioid crisis? I actually we're, agree. We're, <laughs> it's a great question. No, all right, so, all right, there's so much there. Yeah. Um, there and is. I think that this gets at uh, the two underlying currents in that question that I think are essential. <laughs> One, which we haven't talked about, is the public health dimension of these technologies, that they are reversed engineered to addict us. And um, uh, there's an analogy um, that I, I have in the book, which is to process food. So 50 years, uh, more than 50 years ago, we had the advent of TV dinners and processed foods. And it seemed pretty great at the time because there were no more dishes to clean up after the meal. You didn't have to go shopping every day. And it kind of tasted pretty good. And then you woke up many decades later and you said, holy cow, these things were stuffed full of sugar, salt, and lipids, and they were engineered to addict us. And it had tremendous consequences for the whole economy of producing food and for our waistlines and for our planet. And I would argue that the same thing that happened to the stuff that we ingested through our mouths is happening to the things that we ingest through our head. And here's what, I mean, Facebook is very much reverse engineered to addict us, as I've described before in the way that it exploits human emotions in order to increase engagement. Your phone is designed to addict you. It buzzes constantly. Um, it, you're always being notified. Your attention is being commandeered constantly by people who are trying to profit from it. Um, and it, it's become, you know, th there's so many people who sleep with their phones. I didn't mean it like that. Um, <laughs> uh, they, 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 they and, and what ends up happening is even if it's possible, it's possible to put your phone to sleep. 
Um, and, but even so, even if your phone's not notifying you in the middle of the night, everybody wakes up in the middle of the night at some point, and your phone's there, and you kind of have this almost um, biological inclination to pick it up in the middle of the night and get stuck in some sort of endless scroll. <laughs> and it disrupts your circadian rhythms, and it's, it's what I'm describing. And that is the merger with the machine. And they're running, they're running experiments on us constantly. We are, we are, we are lab rats um, in, in experiments that they're running constantly, where they're trying to figure out how they can best manipulate human behavior, how they can best exploit the, all the data that they've amassed in order to manipulate you further. And so these forces are incredibly powerful. And it's actually, it's a public health problem. And we need to treat it as such. And I think part of that response it has to be a, a, a different paradigm that we take towards educating our kids. That when we see our kids mindlessly, you know, that you see the three-year-olds who don't know how, who, who think that you turn pages in physical books by swiping, or they get addicted to YouTube programs uh, where they, they sit in a zombie state for hours and hours watching, you know, the dumbest things imaginable. I mean, we, we see that and the problem jumps out at us in a way that it doesn't when it comes to our own use of technology. But we've talked a lot about government, but I think that there, there is an onus on the individual as well to try to learn moderation as it relates to these devices. This is another Brandeisian concept. Yeah, I was thinking the same um, No, but it's, um, you know, we, we, food and drink are addictive as well. Yet, we all learn from a ver very early age how to moderate our, 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 our use of those two things. And we have to learn to do the same thing as it relates to technology. Uh, there's time for one last question, and this is a beautiful one. Thank you, colleagues, for these phenomenal uh, questions. And here it is. What is the impact of these platforms on the arts as well as on spirituality? typically seen as non-tech aspects of humanity. Does this impact matter? How will it affect the human species? <laughs> wow, it's right. You got come to the National Constitution Center for yeah. some great questions. So I actually think that this is the most important spiritual question of our time. And I think that there is, when I, when I wrote, called the book, um, subtitled the book, The Existential Threat of Big Tech. Really, the threat that I was describing, I think, is almost, it's, it's almost a spiritual one, which is that when these companies are trying to hijack our attention and, and using these fairly nefarious methods to redirect our attention, they're actually destroying something that's very, very precious, which is our ability to contemplate the world that when your thought is being manipulated in, 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 in invisibly in ways that kind of are beyond our, our, our awareness and comprehension, um, we are slowly but surely, you know, it, it, we risk losing our ability to actually contemplate the world, and, which means our ability to formulate independent thoughts, our ability to exist in realms where somebody, somebody's not looking over our shoulder all the time, where we're umbilically connected to corporate stores, where, we're, um, where we're, we live in a state of perpetual distraction. And so the question is, is it even possible? I mean, it, the possible, the aggregate effect of all this could be to diminish our ability to actually be spiritual creatures in the end. Um, it certainly risks diminishing our ability to be good citizens, um, since the core concept of citizenship is that you're able to look at this big, complicated world and formulate your own views of it, your own independent views of that. And that requires contemplation, as well as quality information. And so the stakes are incredibly high. Um, but the good news is, is that 
you know, all these behavioral experiments that they're running on us are incredibly powerful, but human beings are pretty powerful too. And um, I believe in the ability of government to help us um, combat this problem, but I also believe that human beings have, have, have it within their own capacity to fight for the things that are actually human. Frank, you've just told us that the tech companies are threatening our ability to be spiritual creatures, but we have it within ourselves to restore the light and to spread liberty. Ladies and gentlemen, you can now see why conversations with Frank help me develop my faculties. You have educated uh, me through our friendship and you've educated the world for sharing the light and casting light on this crucial national problem. Please join me in thanking Frank Worth.